Okay, thank you. Um, so I've called this or a meeting of the Anchorage Assembly's Committee on Homelessness to order. It's 11 o'clock on Wednesday, October 21st. Um, Travis, if you could go ahead and call the roll and we'll get going. We can't hear you if you've started to call the roll, but if the clerk's office could go ahead and call the roll, that would be great. Okay, it looks like we're having a technical issue. So um, let me see if I can do this. Um, so, um, I'm Meg Zalatel and I'm here. Um, Mr. Dunbar? Here. Okay. Um, Ms. Allard? Ms. Kennedy? Ms. LaFrance? Mr. Rivera. Okay, I see Ms. Allard is here. Um, Ms. Quinn Davidson. Um, excuse me, Ms. Quinn Davidson. Uh, if you're not speaking, if you could mute your mic, that would be really great. Uh, Mr. Weddleton. I see Mr. Weddleton. Um, Mr. Constant? Oh. Here. Um, we're going to go ahead and get to cover. Uh, Mr. Rivera is here. Mr. Weddleton is here. Um, note for the record. Um, so we did not have anyone sign up for initial audience participation today, so we're going to jump right in. Um, we are going to do things a little bit differently today. Um, as folks may have or aware, may be aware of the. Um, in the paper recently, there have been some articles about uh, concerns around winter sheltering. There's been new CDC guidance for Anchorage around winter sheltering, and there is a petition currently circulating with about 15,000 plus signatures uh, on asking the community to turn the Bemboki Arena back on for shelter. So we are going to do the deep dive into the winter sheltering plan today um, and outreach as those two things um, will be related um, <clears throat> because we want to be able <clears throat> Excuse me, be sure to get through what the entire plan is. I'm going to ask to handle all questions at the end so we don't run down any particular rabbit hole. I'm hoping we can get through the presentations quickly enough um, that there's plenty of time for questions, but I want to make sure we get through the entire set of presentations so that we um, have a good sense of the plan and then can do follow ups. Note for the record, we're joined by Pete Peterson. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to the Anchorage Coalition to End Homelessness to talk about outreach. Members, I will keep track of you in the queue if you want to put in that you have a question early on just so that you don't lose track. Um, and I will, uh, and Mr. Constant has joined us for the record as well. Um, but remember, I will take, I will um, take us to questions at the end. All right, Co uh, Anchorage Coalition to End Homelessness, please take it away. Hi folks, this is Jasmine. I am just trying to figure out how to share my screen. Um, do we have Dakota on the line? Hi, yes, this is Dakota, I'm here. Excellent. Um, so if everybody can hear and see, I'll kick us off and hand it over to Dakota. Um, I, I think you've all heard me say this before, but outreach was a concern um, prior to COVID. When I say outreach, I mean specifically street outreach where we have regular canvassing of locations like camps, um, alleyways, park spaces where we know that people experiencing unsheltered homelessness congregate. 
in partnership with Desmond, the I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, people are having a hard time hearing you. So if you could try to be a little bit closer to your mic and speak up a bit, that would be helpful. Sure. Is this better? Oh, sorry. Yes, that sounds better for me. So I'll let you know if some, if I get more notes that they can't hear. Thank you. Um, I guess to provide a bit of a background, um, historically we had the mobile intervention team assist in outreach, and we had a number of organizations that had person-specific outreach happening in Anchorage, meaning that there were providers that were out in park spaces the mall, looking for specific individuals who they needed to serve. What we did not have in Anchorage was widespread outreach that regularly canvassed parks, camp spaces, um, other places where unsheltered individuals congregate. Um, I'm so grateful that earlier this year, the Anchorage Health Department, in partnership with the Assembly, allowed us to pilot street outreach in Anchorage differently. Um, that was something we wanted to do prior to COVID, but the pandemic certainly made that more important. Um, so I'm going to turn the conversation over to Dakota Orm, who is our outreach coordinator at the coalition. Uh, she's one of our staff people, and she's going to talk about the work that she's been doing with the organizations in town around uh, street out outreach to people living outside over the last couple months. Uh, Dakota, go ahead. Thank you and good morning, uh, members of the assembly. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy agenda to talk about my favorite topic, outreach in our community. So I'll be going over where outreach has come over the last six to seven months and talk a bit about what other opportunities are possible with outreach to better benefit the individuals that we serve. Next slide, please. So through partnership with the Anchorage Health Department, we were able to pilot outreach in the community. In April, we started off in the pandemic with no contact with our unsheltered community. We didn't know who was out there or where people were and had to navigate COVID-19 restrictions. In June, we had a strong team of one. We didn't have a static schedule quite set up yet, but we were starting to get an idea of where people were and what the process could potentially look like. Come August, we have an incredible team of four, a weekly schedule that covers the municipality at least twice a month, an organization we can refer our most vulnerable, and we're starting to get a better idea of who is out there. So now in October, we have a strong team of seven, a weekly schedule, and an expanded weekly schedule with target locations. We have two organizations to refer our most vulnerable, both Choices and Covenant House. We're providing on-location COVID-19 testing, and we're building rapport within the community. We know their names, where people sleep, and where they tend to spend time during the day. Next slide, please. So for the first time, as Jasmine mentioned, we have ongoing and consistent data about how many people are outside. So for August and September, Outreach made contact with 399 individuals already in our system, 285 of which did not access any shelter during that time and met 125 new clients. And of those contacts, they completed 172 coordinated entry assessments and 10 people have been housed through choices in mainstream housing. And through collecting this data weekly, staff were able to identify a population within our unsheltered community that may be great candidates for a rapid rehousing program or potentially a new shelter down the line. We're learning the barriers that are keeping people from accessing shelter and day by day, we're getting to know this community more and more. So we've heard from both outreach staff and our unsheltered population that this process has value, is continuously getting better, and is beneficial to the community as a whole. Our unsheltered clients who have been houseless for long periods of time are starting to trust our outreach staff because of the continued connections that they make and the care that they give in every interaction. A population that has often felt overlooked is now being checked in on, connected to different resources, and given life-saving materials like hygiene kits and also food. In the last few weeks, in order to keep our community safe and healthy, we've coordinated testing our unsheltered population for COVID-19. Outreach staff assist hands-on while nurses from Visit Healthcare administer the tests. We've completed 131 tests so far, and of those, only two have been positive. And when we receive a positive result, we are notified right away, and outreach staff at their next availability will locate the person Visit Healthcare provides some education, and then that person is transported to the guest house for quarantine and isolation. 
And this process allows us to identify a positive in the community right away so that they can begin isolating and avoid a spread in this already vulnerable population. And so through our continued contacts with individuals, we're able to better locate them and provide them with life-saving materials. When we received these sleeping bags that were donated, our outreach staff knew exactly the person they wanted to give one to. She's a young 23-year-old woman, and through building up a rapport with the community, outreach staff were able to build trust enough for her to tell them where she'll be, and she's now working with Covenant House. So we've had a great couple months connecting with people in the community and getting to know them and we've worked out some kinks and now as we look forward into the next couple months how can we adjust to better meet the demands of our population our schedule will work to reflect the change in movement from our population as we head into our colder season and with our new increased team size we can have different teams that canvas our known unsheltered locations and a team that has more catch those folks we may be missing. Our community is innovative and we need to be able to meet their needs. So we're hoping to expand our partnerships within the homeless prevention and response system so that we may have more agencies providing outreach and also expanding the agencies that we may refer clients to. And this could include the new rapid rehousing programs that are being run through the Sullivan Mass Shelter. And further, we're planning for donation drives in the upcoming months to receive life-saving supplies from our giving neighbors. And we're continuing to test and retest our population for COVID-19 so that if a positive does come up in our community, we can quickly move that person into quarantine and isolation to prevent a spread. So looking into the future, how can we expand outreach and strengthen our community response to unsheltered homelessness? How do we include the community and ensure community buy into our mission? And how do we make outreach a permanent part of the homeless prevention and response system? So in discussions with different people throughout the system, there were so many great ideas that were generated on how to improve outreach for the betterment of Anchorage as a whole. And I would love the opportunity to work through these ideas and share them with the committee and understanding that there is a big agenda and lot, a lot to get through. I would like to say thank you and that we're hopeful that the city will continue investing in outreach so that we may continue to make a difference. For example, this summer, outreach staff met a man living in his car near the library. Without outreach, he would not have known where to connect to services. And so through being able to locate him and have consistent staff in our community looking for people, he now has his own apartment, is working full time, and is thriving in our society. The municipality offers a lot of opportunity to have a united front in making homelessness rare, brief, and one time. And so I'd love to open it up to any questions or comments that myself or our executive director, Jasmine Boyle, can answer. Thank you, Dakota, for the presentation. I think what we're going to do is move on to talking about the winter sheltering plan. But if you and Jasmine can continue to join us, um, I think there may be some questions about how outreach and winter sheltering uh, fit together as we move along. Okay, with that, we're going to go ahead and move on to the winter sheltering plan. And I believe we have some folks from the administration who are going to walk us through that. I turn the floor over to you. Nancy Burke or Jason Hi. Bach instead. There we go. Thank you. This is Nancy. I was um, muting and unmuting myself. Um, so I'm going to kick off and uh, walk through the numbers uh, that were provided in the PowerPoint, and then I will turn it over to Heather for the second part. Nancy, do you need me to show the PowerPoint or are you going to screen share? Is that work? Is it showing now? Perfect. Thank you. OK. So um, this is fairly high level. Um, there's a lot of content, so I just want to walk you through the capacity numbers uh, to make sure that all the members have a good view of what's happening with COVID right now and our capacity as it looks for this coming winter. Um, so continue. I forgot to mention that these presentations are on the committee's web page. Um, through the assembly link and then committees for those of uh, the folks that um, are joining us on the phone. And I also need to note uh, we've been joined by Miss Kennedy. Thank you. Sure. 
This is a diagram that shows a graph that shows um, the capacity across a few winter months um, and including some summer information from 2019. Um, so that uh, a picture of how our shelter capacity changes through through the time and um, seasons. So if we um, just take a look at the top line of this Brother Francis shelter, for example, um, they've they've had a, a historical capacity of about 240 persons um, throughout winter and summer year round. That's been their number um, and which changed during COVID down to 114 starting in March of 2020 and then was revised to 62 um, in uh, September of 2020. Um, the Gospel Rescue Mission is a similar. Um, they've had traditional year round capacity of about 100 spaces. They revised their number to 41 and have have remained there. Covenant House uh, has not changed, has maintained capacity um, and has continued. Awake has uh, changed some of their spacing and and saw a reduction and so and so. So uh, downtown Hope Center, um, the the change that's happening that's the most change is the municipality's contract for additional bed space in winter months has gone from 100 in 2018. It was revised in 2019 to 166 after we had a, a year of data to examine um, how many people were coming in for shelter. And then this year, due to the changes um, in the columns above, in the rows above, um, we've raised that to 350. Um, Given that we had to revise our capacity in September, you see that there has been new um, new housing opportunities, new units brought on for persons in area hotels to ensure that we are maintaining open capacity at the Sullivan Arena. And then the last line is one that I'll just put a bookmark in. Um, we'll come back to it. The warming area is something that is required as a policy for the community through APD if officers come across a person when it's 10 degrees or below, um, they transport that person to a location. And uh, during this winter, that will have some particular um, importance for our discussions. So the challenge for us, as you can see, is that uh, many of our shelters have changed their um, procedures for accepting new persons and and have taken an approach that's working um, for the persons that they are sheltering. So there are a number of places that have limited um, referrals and and using criteria. So for instance, Brother Francis is taking people who have mobility challenges and who are um, who would be limited in uh, their access to all the areas at the Sullivan Arena, given the the number of stairs um, environment there. So Brother Francis is um, taking people, but on a on a limited basis. The Gospel Rescue Mission has taken an approach where they have just hung on to a cohort of people. They started um, uh, in March with the number of people that were in their location, and you can see in this chart over the course of June, July, August and, and September, their number continues to decline. So they're currently at 17 to date in October. Downtown Hope has um, also uh, reduced their their uh, number to 40. They've they've largely tried to hang on to the folks that are there and they're working with the women um, who are in their program and are taking some limited referrals um, as as they have openings. So this leaves the only open shelter in the community for anyone who is newly homeless or who um, is uh, is presenting requesting shelter as the Sullivan Arena. So you can see that our capacity at Sullivan is of particular importance to us because we need to maintain some space um, for new people who are newly homeless and for those who would be coming in um, from unsheltered status for shelter this winter. 
that is why you see the census reduction efforts that we've been doing. We now have 70 units of hotel uh, spaces that we're using to pull the pressure off of the Sullivan. And last week, if you saw the newspaper, you you knew that we were in a very challenging position where we were at our limit and taking a wait list and some nights even potentially turning some people away. Since we've added the balance of these units, we have not had to uh, turn people away from the Sullivan Arena, although we remain over capacity. And the capacity for our contract at the Sullivan is 350. We would like to leave a, about an 8% vacancy at that um, location because we want to have space if new people are, are coming in because we don't know what impact economically COVID will have on a number of households. We do not want the only open shelter to be at max capacity. So we're looking at a number of options. We know that this is a very stressful, extremely challenging situation for our partners at Beans Cafe who are on the front lines of this um, tight space. Um, we're working to examine a number of options um, that we've talked about with this committee and in other settings to bring on capacity so that we don't remain at this high level at the Sullivan Arena. The last chart is one that is uh, the numbers that we have um, from our dial-in system. We have an app that calls each of our shelter locations each night um, to ask how many people are in shelter and we're able to use those census numbers for our planning purposes. One of the things that we're trying to um, anticipate is how many people we might see coming in in the winter months and whether or not they've already come into the Sullivan Arena because we've been able to offer that capacity year round for our first year. And so this chart shows uh, the months and the, the total census in each of those locations um, starting when we began the call in app, which was in April of 2019 um, through the current time. So you can see on the um, the right hand side, the column that says 2020 average capacity. That 559 number is our current average for October 1 through October 20. And you can see that that's higher than our highest capacity we saw in 20, 2019 2020 winter, which was this past January at five. So we are already um, likely experiencing an, an uptick in homelessness due to COVID um, or other circumstances. Um, we just simply don't have a good estimate of how much higher we think that will go over the remaining months of this winter. I'll take a break there and see if there are questions. Actually, Nancy, we're going to leave all questions to the end so we can get through the whole set of oh. information today. We'll your plan. Thanks. Okay, then I will um, pass the baton to Heather, who's going to talk about um, some of our strategies of how we're addressing uh, decompression of our shelter space. Hello, thank you. This is Heather Harris, Director of the Anchorage Health Department. Um, I'm going to review a little bit around the CDC HUD recommendations that were recently released. Um, we had a field team join us here in Anchorage and conducted multiple interviews and, um, and uh, assessment of our system and specifically in relation to the outbreak among persons experiencing homelessness. Um, and, uh, and the outbreak of uh, COVID positive cases. Uh, the report, as Meg uh, shared, is on the municipal website uh, and can be reached um, or reviewed there, uh, both the field report and the survey report that was conducted. Ultimately, uh, the CDC recommended persons uh, experiencing homelessness uh, for us to, uh, to address um, three main areas. The first one was forming a multi-agency task force and that we would coordinate the response uh, to COVID positive individuals here in Anchorage. And we have started that initial task force. Uh, it, it has been in, um, in 
regular meetings on weekly meetings for the last uh, few weeks now. And that's a partnership that includes state, federal and local agency su agencies with subject matter expertise to help us really work through the overall recommendations, but also our general strategy around how we um, how we mitigate COVID amongst persons experiencing homelessness. So that is in the works and moving forward. Uh, the second recommendation was around improving isolation and quarantine facilities and specifically around the separation of those facilities, enhancing services um, on site and to facilitate access to housing at the completion of isolation and quarantine. And at this point, we have moved forward on several of those recommendations, um, specifically around uh, improving the, the food selection and options and resources there as well as looking at enhancing services such as behavioral health supports uh, that is not in place at this point, but uh, should be uh, in the near term. So some great uh, partnership and work moving forward in that uh, with the state of Alaska. The third recommendation was on expanding non congregate shelter options and specifically around prioritizing moving people who are, who are at higher risk for severe disease from COVID to non-congregate shelter options, which allows more congregate shelter beds to be available during the winter months. As we look at this, um, this recommendation, uh, I want to highlight that as we think about um, what non-congregate settings might look like, the, what this really translates into is looking at individual housing or apartment type of setting for this high risk population. We are actively pursuing what this can look like and looking at non congregate options and have gone through the process of identifying um, or in the process right now of identifying those most vulnerable. Um, thanks to the Anchorage Coalition on Homelessness to really work through uh, this data and understanding what those numbers might look like. Preliminary information shows that about 40% of the people in shelter or unsheltered situations um, could, could meet the definition of the at-risk uh, category and need that safe non-congregate setting to protect them uh, from potential outbreaks. And that is, uh, that's the synopsis of the CDC recommendations and where we are at this juncture. I'm happy to entertain questions at the end as you shared. Okay, is there any further presentation from the administration? Um, and I did invite, and I don't know if Mr. Falsey joined us, if there was any um, discussion or anything he wanted to share from the emergency operations um, perspective, as I know there's overlap in the uh, response. Yes, this is uh, Bill Palsy. I am here. I'm mostly here to answer questions. I think for present purposes, I can just say that from a very big picture, I think everyone is fully aware that we had a shelter system that was uh, full to capacity before COVID. COVID thoroughly broke it, and so we have picked up the pieces with the Sullivan Arena as we are now entering the winter season. Sullivan is now uh, reaching beyond capacity, and our commitment is just that we are going to figure out how to survive this winter without putting anybody uh, out in the streets to the best that we can make that happen. And that has meant a lot of stopgap measures, which I'm sure we can get into going forward as we are looking for a more permanent steady state. Uh, but in the interim, it has meant um, going out and finding some shorter term hotel kind of capacities. I mean, we have to answer questions about that going forward. Thank you, Mr. Falsey. Um, anything else from the administration or we'll dive right into questions? OK, uh, Mr. Dunbar, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, for Nancy and for Heather, I apologize. I uh, stepped out for just a minute. So if one of you said this and uh, and I missed it. I apologize. But if you could please reiterate, I guess I have two two questions. One is, so we passed a million dollars in um, funding using the CARES Act for transitional housing. Um, how exactly is that going to be deployed and um, how long will that last and how many people can we get housed with that? That's my first question. And the second is, and I guess this is if Jason's in this meeting, I, I suppose we go to him as well. But to me, this sounds like um, 
exactly why we purchased several of the properties, particularly the hotel in Spinard that was going to become transitional housing and hopefully by doing so take off take some pressure off of our shelter capacity. And so I'm wondering um, how the due diligence is going on that building and um, if it goes well, what's the sort of time frame? What's the earliest we could think that that facility might be open and would it be open in time to uh, to take some pressure off of the Sullivan? Thank you. Don't everybody this, speak at once. <laughs> this is Nancy. Why don't I tackle the rapid rehousing, the um, housing program, and then I'll turn it over to Jason for the other responses. Uh, yes, yeah, so there was uh, funding in the approved uh, resources for rapid rehousing program. We've been working with um, a potential contractor for that, and we're in the final stages of getting the contract um, ready. Uh, so the concept that we're working from is using the one of the locations that we're having people come out to hotel rooms to base the um, nonprofit there so that we can have people, you know, quickly and easily in in reach and work with them to transition out to housing. And so the best guess we have is the the first push of uh, rapid rehousing that was done um, from April to June housed about 200 people over three months. And so we're sort of using that as our guide that we think we can do that again. And so we'll look to um, begin that pipeline of people out. So as soon as we house people from those hotel locations, we'll pull in the next uh, group of folks. So 200 people over three months starting in November, or is that too soon? Uh, uh, I'm hoping October. I'm still working on October. OK. Um, and that's, I mean, it's a million dollars of funding. That seems like. Uh, that should be incentive, right? Yes, yes, definitely. And so, you know, the idea is to work with people on jobs and to work with them on those opportunities that could increase their income so that we have a short, as short a period as of possible um, for deposit and rental assistance, uh, you know, perhaps starting the first month full rental assistance and then scaling it down or giving them, you know, however much time we think it'll take them to get their income in place so that uh, they're sustainable. That's that's the we're focusing on people who have more economic ability to be stable quickly for this program. And then there are others like Home for Good that we've talked about that are also, uh, you know, searching for their um, tenants to lease up in housing that'll be longer term. So we're basically trying to cue people to all the housing opportunities we have available right now as quickly as possible. Thank you. And um, Madam Chair, if we could follow up on that second question, I don't know if there is someone from the administration that can speak to um, the Spinard property in particular, but if the Beans property is also going to be used for this, I'm curious. Sure, um, Mr. Bakkenstead or um, I don't know, maybe even Ms. Ward, I, if they're on. Yeah. Yeah, I might see, this is this is Jason Bakkenstead, I might see if Robin is available just to give a quick update on the uh, due diligence side of of the, the work and then I can uh, jump in after. Uh, this is Robin Ward. I'm the director of real estate and I am managing the acquisition of the three properties. Um, we do have three properties under contract that would be the America's Best Value Inn, the former Alaska Club and the Golden Lion. The um, first one we hope to close and uh, bring into service will be the America's Best Value Inn. The due diligence uh, report and, and building condition reports are due November 2nd on that building. Once those are reviewed, um, we've already reviewed all of the entitlements and the um, um, uh, the title reports. So once the condition reports are in for the building, then we'll be able to review those and move towards closing. Right now we're scheduled for closing um, in December, but we could even move it up a little earlier than that if needed. So again, we're, we're on track for closing that one. 
Um, I think that um, Ms. Salatel also asked about beans. Beans would be an engagement center, so it would not increase the capacity for shelter there. And then I'll turn it over to Jason for any further comments. Yeah, I think the only other thing that I would um, add is that, um, you know, in conjunction with, you know, the, the new CDC uh, recommendations that, that Heather discussed and kind of the timeline that we're working under for the, the RFP uh, specifically for the America's Best Value is likely um, going to give us uh, or, or pre present the challenge of what does the next several months look like and how much capacity do we have? I think as both Nancy and Heather have, have commented, um, we're still not sure um, how many folks there there are that still, you know, historically come into the shelters in November, December timeframe. But, um, you know, our hope is that uh, by, you know, first quarter next year, you know, we're, we're in a position where uh, America's best value, at least, is is available to start the process of really relieving some of the stress, uh, either on the Sullivan or some of the other shelters. But we're still going to have a, a, a couple of months where, um, I think, as we've discussed over the last hour, for 35 minutes or so, there's, you know, going to have to be some other plans and ideas that that come about. Can I ask a real quick follow-up, Madam Chair? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I, I understand that our intent was to use the Beans Cafe building as a uh, engagement center, but I know it has been used in the past as cold weather emergency shelter. Um, I might not be using the exact right phrase, but we've used it in on, in winters in the past. Has that been considered as a potential site for some folks, perhaps just for a few months this winter? This is Robin Ward again. And uh, that entire interior of beans right now is being used for meal preparation and distribution and they are um, they're under contract not only for the Sullivan Arena but two or three other locations so that would not be possible this winter while they are actually um, prepping and distributing the number of meals that they are every day in t inside that building got it thank you thank you madam chair Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Um, Mr. Weddleton, please. Well, thanks. I actually, I, I, the force kind of worked his way through all the questions I had. Thank you. OK, I'm going to put myself in the queue now um, and welcome. We have plenty of time. Um, I set this up so that there was plenty of time to dive down into any particular area we wanted to. Um, so my question is, given the latest uh, CDC guidance uh, for non-congregate shelter, is um, there any current plans to look for additional locations for congregate shelter? Um, or are we really just putting our efforts into non-congregate shelter consistent with the CDC guidance? Our focus at this point has really been around the non-congregate given, um, given the recommendations from CDC as well as really as we look at the number of uh, individuals that are meeting that criteria. And so as we think about how to mitigate COVID as we go into the winter and people are in more um, indoor settings, that's incredibly important to us. And so that's been the majority of the effort at this juncture. Thank you, Ms. Harris. And I have a follow up. Um, the non congregate shelter as we move forward with it, is that an expense that's covered through our current emergency operations or some other funding source? That, that may be a question that I could answer. I missed a little portion of it, though. Um, Ms. Elta, you were asking whether the current non congregate shelter is being funded through FEMA public assistance? Uh, yes, if we're going to focus on uh, non congregate shelter throughout the as a bit part of our wintering shelter plan, um, is that something we're funding through our emergency operations or is there a different funding source? 
Yeah, the immediate efforts are certainly in the category for us of uh, the COVID response, the direct COVID response. And so we're looking for them to be reimbursed to the municipality through the FEMA Public Assistance Program. Um, as the rapid rehousing program funds that the Assembly allocated through the CARES Act appropriations step online, that would relieve some of that. But in, at least initially, that's right, we are looking for this to be part of our main COVID FEMA reimbursable response. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Um, this is the time we're going to talk about winter sheltering. We've got different items for next month. So I really want to give um, members here the chance to dive in. Um, Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Ms. Zolotel. So one idea that has been floated to me by constituents and I believe the home builders even for some reason um, has been the idea of modular buildings of some kind uh, or temporary structures in the parking lot of the Sullivan Arena. Is that something that is being seriously considered or investigated? And this is Bill. I'm not aware of any ongoing plans for modular expansion in the parking lot of the Sullivan Arena. We have had over the years a number of offers for surplus man camps or uh, J Bear facilities that are no longer necessary. My understanding has always been that the operations of those had been real impediments, and some of them actually been kind of low quality, where even the capital side would require a lot of work. But that upon investigation, it just hasn't really seemed to be the easy or ready answer that folks think that it might well be. Um, and I don't know if I can solicit some thoughts from Robin Ward on that. Um, but but suffice to say, the answer to your particular question is no, I'm not aware of an ongoing effort to, to continue to, to think about expanding into the parking lot. This is Robin Ward. We do. Uh, I I agree with Mr. Falsey. Right now, we do not have um, an effort towards that path. No. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Weddleton, please. Mr. Weddleton, you may be on mute. Of course I was on mute, sorry about that. Um, uh, you know, I'd point to places like Dignity Village where, you know, small shed size structures um, with this shared community area have been very successful for decades with essentially no government involvement except providing the piece of land. But um, so looking at these numbers, and I think Dakota had said that, uh, you know, they've contacted some 285 people who use shelters at and if we're already over, and even with these other programs, it seems like that would overwhelm what we provide. We're all of them to leave living in our parks or wherever they happen to be. Um, so what is the prospect of the year round abatement that we expect to have in the budget for next year? I'll jump in on that one. So I, if I'm, uh, picking up the thrust of the question correctly, um, I think it is well known that we both feel legally constrained and sort of morally obligated not to do a camp abatement if there is no place for people to go. Um, if the thrust of the question is, are we likely to run out of places for people to go? Partly the answer may be yes, but we don't know yet. Um, and that is part because of what Nancy said, which is that even uh, building in an assumption that we're going to have the same total number of people who need to be sheltered as have been in pre-COVID years, we're already gonna be scrambling for space in the CDC separation guidance world. In the COVID world where there may be additional pressures on the shelter system because more people have fallen into homelessness, um, it is an unknown. And, and we are unfortunately in the place of having to feel it out in real time uh, and see what the numbers look like. I, so uh, I don't know that I can give you a solid prediction, but certainly, if we don't have spaces, then the year-round camp abatement couldn't begin in earnest. The year-round camp abatement also may require, even in a perfect world, some lead time, because my understanding is that there was some equipment that the Parks and Recreation folks wanted to acquire before that got up and going. But we can take that question uh, back to Josh and see if he has a better answer for you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Constant. 
Thank you. Can we get that slide back up that showed the various shelters? Is that possible? If it's not possible, that's fine. Nancy, do you still have your slides handy to pop back up for the different numbers? Yeah, just one sec. I'll pull it up. OK, great. Thank you. So when you're looking at this and you're contemplating a conversation about modular expansion of temporary units, I would just point to the fact that already there are 350 individuals who are cited at the Sullivan Arena. It's by far, by triple, by quadruple, by six and 10, more people there than anywhere else. So uh, if anyone is contemplating such a move, I would ask that you contemplate it in your district. Uh, I mean, there are a number of places around Muldoon and Midtown and Diamond and Old Seward where this could happen if you're going to drive policy that way. But already 350 individuals are cited there, plus 40 at the Hope Center, plus 35 at Awake, plus 60 at Covenant House, plus 114 at Brother Francis Shelter. So the motion of this system is not to further add more around the, the campus of the Sullivan Arena, but it is in fact to continue the work of decompressing that location all the way north of Ship Creek. I would just add that I am in complete agreement with the municipality that setting up modulars is fraught with peril. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Um, Ms. Kennedy, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I take a, a an opposite view or approach on that, and I think the modulars do have um, value. Uh, we've seen the Anchorage School District use it for extra capacity for their students for decades. Uh, we know that they're mobile. We know that they serve a purpose uh, when there's kind of a, an emergency and an, and an, an immediate need. Uh, I think the idea of putting them at the Sullivan, at least you have the infrastructure there that provides for showers and laundry. And of course, you know, there are certainly capacity issues with that as well. But, you know, we've also seen the portable uh, toilets set up all around uh, the backside, or I don't know if you'd call that the east side of, uh, of the Sullivan to be able to uh, compensate for some of that as well. But the point is, you know, you get one of these portables, you have a place uh, that is easily accessible and fairly quick to set up uh, and it needs electricity. Um, you know, so I, I think those are certainly valuable or valid in terms of, of investigating a little bit further. Um, uh, but, you know, one of the one of the questions that I have, and I don't really know who wants to tackle this one, but I'm still wrestling with the idea of um, what we're doing with outreach. Uh, it just seems like there's a fine line between helping people and doing the outreach and maybe enabling them to kind of stay where they are. And I'm speaking specifically to this idea of donations and, you know, people bringing in sleeping bags and tarps and whatever else they, they might be trying to do um, to help the homeless who are non-sheltered. And um, I, I don't, like I said, I don't know who really wants to try to tackle this, but I know that when we start giving out sleeping bags, we tend to clean up a lot of sleeping bags. And we know that people move from site to site and they probably don't have the ability to carry with them their current sleeping bag. So they end up at a new site and they get a new sleeping bag and a new tent. And anyway, we just we create the trash. We create the appearance that there are these multiple task or um, camps everywhere. And um, we're to a certain extent not really getting people into some kind of a service. So um, and maybe that's just kind of the crux of the issue and um, the pivotal point in all of this. Uh, but again, that fine line between what we're doing to really accomplish some kind of outreach effort versus enabling uh, by providing more uh, materials for um, some of these folks that are are not choosing um, shelter. So anyway, I just still kind of wrestle with that. Um, um, so thank you. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Miss Kennedy. Miss Boyle, did you want to address that question? Yes, I'm happy to do so. Uh, thank you for the question, um, Assembly Member Kennedy. It's a fine line because um, I agree that you made a lot of important points, particularly around this idea of um, 
helping people to stay in space that we know may not be the best for their health and for the surrounding community. Um, what we're faced with is the reality that um, we do not have space for those uh, almost, um, well, 285 people to come inside at this time. And so um, we aren't left with a whole lot of options when it is snowing, of course, and there is no shelter for this um, new group of people who we've begun to work with to come inside. I'll also say that in working with other communities that have had years of street outreach under their belt, what I have found really compelling is that some of these initial um, amenities that we're able to provide is the relationship building that creates the trust to help these folks come inside. Um, and so when we're talking about collecting donations to date, um, we were actually surprised by um, two things. Uh, one is a local women's group at AT&T contributed hygiene kits um, for people that are outside, particularly women that were outside and unable to access uh, basic hygiene necessities. And then we were surprised by a good Samaritan who donated 50 sleeping bags. Um, so we have not made a concerted effort to organize further donations, but until we have a way to bring the almost 300 folks inside, um, and until we have enough of a relationship with them to help the folks that are really reluctant to come into mass shelter to come inside, um, we have to do something in the interim to keep people alive and safe. And I think we've all heard the really distressing uh, report about the the weather fatalities and other related fatalities in our unsheltered population. And so we're trying to mitigate both. I certainly welcome partnership. Um, if we're able to extend this partnership into 2021, uh, I think in many ways this is the most important work we can do to get unsheltered folks out of camps into housing. Um, and again, I would invite further conversation when the assembly is interested in, in looking at how we could do this further in 2021. Thank you. It looks like uh, Ms. Burke has, Nancy has her hand up as well. Please go ahead. I just wanted to call attention to this slide, um, which is indicating that we've had a rise in numbers over this summer. And when we look at some of the outreach data um, compared to shelter users, we are seeing overlap of campers coming into shelter, um, potentially for a shorter period of time, um, but them coming into shelter is a very important um, outreach aspect or, or inreach, I guess you might call it, so that we can develop those relationships with them at shelter to feel safe and um, potentially participate in housing programs and then move into um, their own housing. But we have seen an uptick and you'll notice in August and uh, September, which were very rainy, we saw the, uh, some pretty big jumps in our shelter numbers, which I believe is related to campers. And so the, the whole system working together where this year we tried some new abatement um, and closure uh, strategies to um, provide incentive for people not to be in the parks and in those locations, but to come to shelter. And then we had shelter that had some more amenities that um, could help them feel safer and, and more secure um, by being able to store their belongings with them, having access to additional showers, you know, those kinds of things. So we're learning as we go, but the entire system should be focusing on us reducing the number of people out in camps and uh, increasing the outflow to housing. Ms. Kennedy, any follow up on that? Uh, no, Madam Chair, no follow up on that, but I do have another question. So you can either put me back in the queue or or I can ask it now, your, your call, thanks. <laughs> Go ahead, we've got time to get to the others in the queue. Okay, well, this one will be fairly short anyway. Um, I was just wondering what relationship we have uh, with uh, University of Alaska here in Anchorage uh, and as to whether there's been any more conversation about the potential for using some of their dormitories. I'm assuming they don't have a lot of students using the dorms uh, this semester, so just wondered uh, kind of what the current conversation was with them in regard to potentially using their, their them as a resource. Thanks. 
This is Jasmine. I can speak to that if no one at the administration has um, a more recent update. I have an update that's a couple months old. Well, I can start and then um, Jasmine, if I miss anything, feel free to jump in. Bill Falsey again. We had had conversations with the university about potentially using dorm space, not directly for uh, shelter decompression efforts, but possibly for isolation and quarantine. And there, when we ran numbers against alternatives um, <clears throat> and looked at sort of the, the amenities um, for isolation and quarantine purposes, like are you going to be able to keep people actually staying in their rooms? The dorm rooms don't have televisions. They, there wasn't anything there for them to do. Um, it was an attractive option for us and it was a more expensive option. So I'm not aware of any ongoing conversations um, currently to use the dorm space, but uh, if if I'm behind the curve, then I'm sure Jasmine or someone from the Emergency Operations Center will clean that up for me. So this is Jasmine. Yeah, our conversations with the university were prior to COVID. Uh, there was an interest with everything going on at the university system look at ways to better utilize their dormitories. Um, we had some initial conversations with them and really determined that um, we would want to be sensitive, especially at the time because there were students on campus, as to um, what are the dynamics of people experiencing homelessness who would work well on campus. Um, we had some very exciting preliminary interest in helping some of our elders to look at using that housing space. Um, I think everyone's aware UAA has a gerontology program, a school of social work, other opportunities that might make it an ideal space for our elder community members um, to stay connected but also get housing. Those conversations halted uh, due to COVID, but I do hear tangentially that at some point in the next couple of months, the university may be interested in picking that back up again. But it was not intended to, as as uh, Mr. Falsey said, to decompress the shelter system, but to look at a subpopulation of people that would be mutually beneficial to the campus environment. And of course, um, everything has changed pretty drastically because of COVID. Well, thank uh, thank you. Maybe it's time to maybe re-ask the question or reformulate the question and see if there's some interest in potentially, you know, collaborating with with us in regard to that because that is significant. Is a it is an interesting location being between two hospitals and having uh, transit connections. So anyway, um, I I hope you'll maybe re-ask the question and maybe brainstorm a little more. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy. Mr. Constant. I'm actually going to pass. Thank you. OK, thanks, uh, Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, Ms. Brick's comments um, got me thinking uh, about a couple of things that we haven't heard. So first is um, I wanted to see if someone from HRAC was available and, and potentially had some thoughts on this whole discussion. And then second, wanted to see um, just get a better understanding of what we're learning from this outreach that we're doing to help inform this discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Um, is there anyone from HRAC on the line with us today? If so, and if you're on the phone, uh, star six to unmute. Go ahead and just let us know you're on. Hello. I'm not. Oh, yes, please identify Hello. yourself for the record and go ahead. Hi, this is Sid McCausland. I work with Iraq. Uh, we're very impressed with the city's efforts to stay on top of this with the houses community, and we appreciate the fact that testing of unhoused people have been taking place. It's an amazing effort. Uh, there are people in camps who, if we put them in housing without wraparound social services, are, are doomed to almost instant failure. And we, we really need to think about how to treat these people because these are also people who are very uncomfortable and unsuitable for joining the population in the shelters. But everything else you're doing is just fabulous. So if there's any way to think about how do you deal with the people that really don't have the life skills necessary to cope with being domiciled or domesticated. Uh, 
those are the ones that we've always discarded in the past and we shouldn't do that any longer. But thank you for your opportunity to testify. Thank you. Mr. Rivera, did you have any follow-up for, um, uh, for Sid? No, not right now. I'm, I'm curious to hear a response to my second question. Thanks. This is Rose Hubbard, and I have worked with Harak. Um, I wanted to say that uh, I wanted to second the uh, statement made by Sid. Um, there are quite a number of people that I have been personally in touch with that uh, do not like the feeling of being... Um, corralled is, is a word that they have used um, and um, have a lot of distrust of um, uh, government and um, government run facilities um, and uh, so I have I have formulated my uh, my proposal, and um, I'm sure most people are aware of it, but I am ready to be up and running. I have all the um, connections and um, abilities. The only thing needed is uh, land and uh, financing. Um, you Thank know, you. A Ms. fog Hubbard. map uh, is ready. Thank you, Ms. Hubbard. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, I appreciate you sharing your Harak experience. Um, Ms. Boyle or um, Dakota, if you wanted to address um, Mr. Rivera's other question. Um, and he can remind you of it if you need. Yes, please. Thanks, Madam Chair. So, yeah, the other question was simply what are we learning from? from a lot of this outreach that we are doing that helps to inform the discussion today. Uh, similar along the lines of, you know, what is Harak hearing? What is outreach hearing? Thanks. Uh, I will happily turn that over to Dakota, who's working directly with um, our unsheltered individuals and the outreach team. The, the one thing I, I will say before that is, um, you know, Dakota mentioned earlier that we were able to, through the work of choices, house 10 individuals right out of the streets into housing. Uh, but I think Mr. McCausland's point is really important. We got those folks into mainstream housing. They happened to be folks that had really um, less vulnerability than some of our more complex cases, but they, there is no support or wraparound services for those individuals. And what I personally have found really heartbreaking in the outreach conversations the team meets weekly is that um, without the right support services, getting someone into an everyday apartment is almost always a failure. Uh, especially for our long-term chronic homeless individuals who have lived on the streets for a long time. They don't have the social support system, nor do they have the social connectivity to navigate such a drastic change. Um, so one of the challenges that I am directly hearing from the outreach group is it's wonderful to connect to people, to help them trust us, to get them tied in with resources, even if it's just a vaccine or COVID testing. But um, the biggest gap we have is appropriate supportive housing with the wraparound services. Um, I'll also say, if nothing alone, I think the last three months of work has been important for data. I think we've heard for a number of years that the Anchorage Police Department was doing a count of unsheltered individuals in the summer months. Last year, that count reported a little bit shy of 250 individuals who were unsheltered. That was the only data we had on the number of people who lived outside in our community. And the public was adamant that that number was too low and that that number may miss people. And what we have found already with daily outreach is we found 400 people who were unsheltered. Now, the number could have shifted because of COVID, but I think even without housing, which is the ultimate goal, being able to talk to these folks daily to tell them where they can get food and where they can access things like Sullivan, 
um, to be able to connect the folks that can connect to mainstream housing, get them IDs, get them employment applications. Um, even that has been a significant help. Um, but I, I'm not on the front line, so I'm happy to make the space for Dakota to chime in and, and share the experience on the front line. Thank you, Jasmine, and thank you, Mr. Rivera, for that question. Yeah, we're starting to learn more about this population and learning those barriers, as I mentioned before, that keep folks from accessing shelter. Um, and this year, especially COVID-19 was a big barrier. A lot of people didn't want to go to a large group setting um, for fear of catching COVID-19. Also, some folks um, experience a lot of substance use issues and pre prefer to not be around other folks that are possibly drinking or using and also mental illnesses prevent them from thriving in larger group settings. And as Jasmine mentioned that after a person is housed for missing that case, the continuing case management to make sure that person is receiving their meds or applying consistently um, for food stamps and, and things like that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so that's everyone in the queue. Uh, last call for any um, further questions um, while we have folks here um, with some time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask a question um, and then check back in the queue. So my question is, is it fair to sum up that the winter sheltering plan as of right now um, per the demand, the CDC guidance, um all of those things combined is that we are trying to decompress the sullivan arena through using non-congregate sheltering means um and then moving those folks through rapid rehousing dollars into housing is, is that a fair summary or um is there some more nuance there that i've missed i think that is accurate Great, thank you. I would okay. Okay. Anything else from the um, administration before we move on to um, the next item in our agenda? Okay. Um, so we have the standing items on our agenda for legislative and budget priorities. Um, is there anything that members of the committee would like to put forward? I will say from the committee perspective. Um, the budget priority for 2021, of course, was expressed through the joint proposal um, the committee uh, put forward with the Health Policy Committee with regards to the alcohol tax as it contained items both with regard to the uh, operating budget and the alcohol tax budget. Um, if there's any feedback or comments about either that or uh, legislative priorities, now would be the time to make those. Okay, seeing and hearing nothing. Um, is there anyone on from the clerk's office that with a mic that's working that can help me navigate audience participation? Okay, well, we will do our best. Um, so audience participation is uh, three minutes. I just ask you to unmute yourself um, and um, state your name and, and I'll begin the timer and then let you know when your time is up. Is there anyone who would like to participate? My name is Rose Hubbard. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, my name is Rose Hubbard. I'm with Anchorage Communal Homeless Village Project. I have in the past been a part of HRAC or HRAC. Um, I wanted to say that, uh, first of all, um, I feel very uh, strongly about um, the lack of uh, housing options uh, currently available to people. We are going to start losing people. They are going to start dying. And at these temperatures, it's it's unrealistic to believe that um, that we can 
uh, realistically put everybody into um, the Sullivan Arena or into uh, some other mass uh, site. Uh, I do have um, a Fognac and I do have a couple of other um, places that are ready, willing and able to provide the uh, shower, the restroom, the um, laundry, and the housing facilities. Um, not not just a place to put put a tent. And the piece of land that I have uh, continually worked for um, is right neck right across from um alaska native medical center and right next to that hub so um it really is a uh viable place and a um a very viable option um that can be up and running uh very quickly um you know a fognac already has they have three to four uh restroom uh or um what they call personal hygiene facilities ready to go um they do all the um all of the planning they do all of the transportation they have a facility that uh, building and ready to build anything and everything that we need up in fairbanks they okay. do the logistics up, up with the last statement that's your time okay um my last statement is i really feel that we need to get this up and going before we start losing people. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Hubbard. Um, I see someone here with their hand up, uh, but I can't see whose hand it is. So if your hand is currently up, can you go that's, ahead and let me yep, know who me. you are? I do. Um, so this is Josh Lowers from Covenant House. Um, and I don't okay. need all three minutes, but I just wanted to say as we're talking about rapid rehousing, um, we have been for the last two years using a rapid rehousing model with 18 to 24 year olds that's been very successful um, and part of the reason that has been very successful is because we've been using a permanency navigator model um, where our our young people are being assigned through coordinated entry a permanency navigator who is following up with them um, often and, and is assigned to them until they turn 25 um, and so it's helping them navigate all of those things. Um, earlier in the conversation, there was talk about wraparound services. And I think we have a model with those permanency navigators. And then we also have rapid housing case managers. And those two folks alongside an 18 to 24 year old has produced um, a lot of really positive results. And so as we think about that with adults, um, I think we have we have a model that we can share or at least lend, you know, some insight into. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like to give t uh, public participation right now? Roger Branson. Please go ahead, Mr. Branson. Yeah, thank you. I, um, yeah, well, first of all, I want to appreciate, I want to express my appreciation for you all the work that you're doing. It's, it's awesome. Um, second, I want to follow up on Sid's comments. Um, I think they were spot on for Harak and, and what we're seeing and add to it a little bit. You know these people who um, who who get accustomed to living on the streets and and are and are on the streets and have been on the streets for a long time. Um, um, they they get some feral quality. I, I, I don't want to use that word lightly, but but you know they get used to not being socialized, to relying on their own, and um, helping those folks move back into society is, is going to be a challenge. They're going to need a lot of wraparound services, but the type of services that they need are the services that they could be helping each other socialize and move into it with. And so I would really, you know, encourage uh, the city to look at uh, peer support models 
and you know trying to apply those you know at the at the very bottom at that level of people just coming out of the really challenging places and um uh, again thank you all and that was that was my comment thank you mr branson um would anyone else like to uh participate me okay mr leva please go ahead your time hey. is starting now yeah yes go this, ahead uh, this is ron oliva ron oliva uh i this methodology that's being used on the phone you can't see the graphs or any of the points being made on the charts so it, it hasn't worked for me and i don't believe it's working for the rest of the participants who want to review the data you're putting on a screen so th this system isn't working that's the first thing the second thing is uh, the modular approach if you're looking for quick housing modulars are available not only from the school district from the borough but also there's stacked pipeline camps there's one in foreclosure right now through wells fargo uh, these camps could be temporary but at least it'll be the shortest route to getting them housed and during the pipeline we did have swine flu we did have std breakouts and there was quarantines uh, in those camps as they are following protocols on the north slope so uh, as far as having uh, modulars william scotsman in wasilla has a stacked pipeline camp so th those are available for quick the quickest housing but also the machine is available and for sale the union makes sheds but Habitat for Humanity, one of the suggestions for my lot was to have their building supplies, larger donations at the industrial site, and they could build these sheds through the union or tiny homes and move them off. It would be a fabrication location. So there's a lot of options that I, I feel are not being really seriously reviewed in going straight to acclimating them into housing. Maybe tiny steps would be a better approach, but Habitat, if they had their sales yard there, uh, that would show homeless people working to build their own homes. And I think that helps in public uh, presentation. Uh, the other thing is uh, basically it, it hasn't been resolved down at Third and Ingra and the camps are coming back I'm very concerned when the shelter shuts their doors to people in wheelchairs. I feel there's handicap abuse, elder abuse, uh, reckless endangerment. And if someone dies there uh, in front of the shelter, uh, it would just be Francis Trader all over. And these numbers that are coming in are so substantial that no one, should be left outside, especially someone in a wheelchair. So I, I'm a little sickened by it. And also I, I reject the idea that all this money is going out there and you're getting those kind of results. So I, you, I'd open Mr. myself Lee, up to uh, questions. That, yes, that do you have any questions, Meg? No questions. I will let you know, and I can uh, email you the link again that all of the presentation materials for today were on the committee's website. And if you'd like me to re email you the link to that spot, I would be happy to. Well, uh -huh. you can, but it includes a phone number and then it just, I get only audio. All right, Mr. Levi. No, you have to bring them up separately. And I'm happy to talk with you offline about how um, we can coordinate that better for you. Um, so next up um, for audience participation, we have um, Ms. Aquino. Lisa Aquino, please go ahead. Uh, Terry. So, hello, this is Lisa Aquino. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I, I just wanted to add, I don't always, I don't usually do this, but just so in case you have any questions because of Mr. Le uh, Aliva's 
testimony, I want to make it clear that um, he's really mischaracterized the situation and people aren't barred from coming in. And um, we're serving as many people as is possible in that building. And if anyone has any specific questions, please never hesitate to reach out directly to me. I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Aquino. Um, anyone else like to give audience participation? Chair. Oh, yep. Can you state your name, please? Uh, Terry Light. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm just responding as a HARAC member. Um, I wanted to respond to the previous question around outreach. And I say, feel like it's really, really um, exhilarating to me that outreach has increased so much. Um, in that process of outreach, people are discovering the conditions people are living in and surviving in. There is a wait list to get into housing and people are discovering that, you know, people don't just need housing, they need relationships. I mean, taking people out of their, uh, the place that they've been surviving in and putting into a house, there's lots of like going back to where their relationships have been, which is on the streets. Um, so this is really big in learning to keep going and doing this outreach. Um, and the part here, if somebody gets in and they're only in and then they can't manage being in that house for a couple of months, they've been indoors a couple of months and they've warmed up and then all of a sudden they're out in the cold again. That's super stressful on the body. Uh, the outdoor conditions is not just about dying, but it's also about going crazy because the brain freezes and the increased amounts of isolation that happens in the dark. And everybody knows how the dark feels, but if you're doing that way more time, there's no light to turn on. So this is the other conditions that are going on out there in the winter time. And I want to previously say we are on Dana in the territory. They never treated people like this. They're always sort of extending people hospitality and sharing food and sharing fire and sharing. And it's like our culture that I have come from, I really seriously know that we're in transition of decolonizing ourselves. This would have never happened, if you know, except we are coming from a huge amount of trauma from Europe. We've wrecked all of the Americas with this. I really, really kind of help bring that into the table. You know, it's like, can we get outside of our boxes or in? This is a really big thing. Let's go out. Let's go out. Let's go out. We can leave our agency. Go talk to some other agencies. Listen to people who have lived experience you're serving. Put them at the table. So again, I'm really appreciating all the work they've done to help open up Sullivan. I've been in there and a lot of people are a lot happier than it. And I see the people like doing better. And I know it's still a long road to go. So thank you. And I just want to put that back out there. Um, and also want to point that Sid and um, Roger talked about wild and feral. I just want to say that people have to do what they need to do. And like what is this whole thing about not being in what we are in boxes and where we're doing our economic life and we're working and we have play and it's all separated out from each other that gets lost out there because their boundaries and walls are gone and it's not a bad experience it's just another experience and it's a necessary experience if you're out there and if you run out of places to meet with people so I, everybody's going to learn more as we go and further this outreach process and if we can open up space for a tent, that'll be great. And thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, all right, looks like we probably have time for um, one more. Um, anyone else like to provide participation today? Okay. Well, with that, I'd just like to thank um, the coalition and the administration for the presentations today. Um, and if any questions come up, I encourage uh, members to ask as we move through um, into this colder season um, and uh, the winter sheltering plan continues to roll out. Um, with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you.